Okay, so in the this part, the second part of this week's lesson, we're going to move in to discuss the Christology and uh, Trinitarian theology of origin. Now, I have to be honest, um, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with origin. He certainly was one of the most titanic intellectual figures of the first three centuries of Christianity. Some would say, and I also say that between St. Paul and St. Augustine, you have origin. Um, his breadth of writings and the depth of his influence is equaled by very few among the church fathers. He was the first systematic theologian and was the first to make scriptural exegesis or biblical exegesis into a science. However, later on, he fell into some theological errors. Um, he submitted all his theology to the judgment of the church and obtained something very close to a martyr's death, theologically anyway. But let me give you a little bit of background on origin, <clears throat> and then we will go into his readings for this week. Origin was born in 185, <clears throat> so in the late second century, in Alexandria, the eldest son of a large Christian family. He was educated by his father and later in the catechetical school under Clement of Alexandria. His father is a saint of the church, St. Leonidas, and he was martyred or killed in persecution for being Christian under Emperor Septimius Servus. At the time of his death, his son Origen was 17 years old and he strongly desired and wanted to be in jail and in prison with his father, but his mother forbade it. When he insisted uh, the way that she prevented him from leaving the house and joining his father in his martyrdom was he basically hid all of Orge's clothes. Um, she didn't give him anything to wear. He couldn't go, he could not leave the house. The young man had to be satisfied with writing his father a letter urging him to take courage and prepare to die for Christ saying, take heed not to change your mind on our account. So in other words, don't lose your faith because of your children and your wife. His father, as I mentioned before, was martyred. For the rest of his life, Origen's life, he greatly desired to imitate his father's martyrdom. And he exhorted his students um, at the School of Alexandria to aspire to also be martyrs. As a matter of fact, one of his most famous writings is a writing entitled, Encourage to Martyrdom. Due to his father's wealth, however, prior to his death, uh, being confiscated by the state, um, Origen initially lived a pretty comfortable lifestyle. However, after his father's death, and because of what he was died from, and the state con confiscating the material wealth, Origen had to be the breadwinner of his family, and he did so by teaching secularly. When Clement left Alexandria because of persecution, Origen was made the new head um, schoolmaster of that catechetical school. He was only 18 years old at the time, but he uh, proved to be a great success and made the school more prestigious during his time there. The Christian historian Eusebius called or nicknamed um, Origen as Antimantius, which means man of steel, because of his strict asceticism and strength. Origen's life was devoted to study and to exposition of the meaning of the Christian and Jewish scriptures. At the same time, Origen was also learning um, traditions of Greek philosophy. As a philosopher, he fell somewhere between Middle Platonism and Neoplatonism. Um, there is no question that Origen loved the scriptures, adored Jesus, and believed that Jesus was God's son. The problem was that he was also being influenced by Platonism. And his theological errors that began to develop are distinctly Neoplatonic. He carried certain notions as the eternal creation of the world, the preexistent of the soul, uh, and the ultimate salvation of all 
intelligent creatures. For this reason, despite his influence on so many of the early church fathers, his reputation suffered um, after his death. It cannot be denied that some of Origen's ideas are contrary to current Christian doctrine, but these weren't declared as heretical until centuries after his death. So his influence still was there for so long. That's the reason why if we're going to have a course on Christology, we have to include his comments, even though his comments on Christology are unorthodox. Um, which leads me to say, if you, if you tried to do the reading before this lecture, which you were assigned origin on first principles, and you're having a hard time reconciling what he's saying or even making any type of connection to what he's saying to our orthodox understanding of Jesus, the word, the logos, God, etc., and you're just not recognizing what's happening here, that means, I mean, that is because Origen is the first reader um, or first assignment you were given who's a writer that actually is writing unorthodox um, teachings about or understandings about Christ, right? So if you were having a hard time, that's good you're having a hard time because it's not orthodox, right? So let's break down Origen's Christology. I'm going to put up a diagram um, that I put together to try to visualize Origins Christology. I'm going to read, I want you to read along with me and I will explain the diagram, but you can also kind of glance at the diagram as I'm reading, as I'm, as I'm lecturing, and it should begin to help, again, visualize Origin Christology what is influenced his, his Christology, and you should already start to see how it is unorthodox um, through my explanation. But let's start by reading, and um, again, I'm in the Christo Christological Controversy text on page 59 is where I'm going to start there in section three. It says, this is origin now, right? So then the only begotten God through whom as our earlier argument taught, all things have been created visible and invisible, both made all things as the scriptures testify and loves what he has made. Since he is himself the invisible image of the uh, invisible God, he conferred invisibly a participation in himself upon all rational creatures. He did this in such a way that each received from him a degree of participation proportioned to the degree to which it clung to him with a disposition of love. But since the capacity for free choice belonged to each of the intellects, each was characterized by variety and diversity and therefore one was possessed by a more burning love for its author, while another's love was thinner and weaker. Let's stop here for a moment. Origen here is writing about the logos. Origen believed that God, the Father, begot wisdom or the logos eternally. There was never a time when the Logos did not exist. This divine Logos, this divine wisdom is a complete expression of God's being, right? So it is a image of God's being, but and this is important. At the same time, the Logos is not God himself, but his image, a second, a subordinate God to the ultimate father of all. And that's the reason why you, I put here on this diagram, you have God and you have the logos. And the logos is a image of God, but it's not God himself. This should be at this point, this should um, 
remind you of Justin Martyr, or at least the reception of Justin Martyrs. Um, speaking of the logos as being mediator between God and eventually I will get to rational creatures, right? So the logos is a perfect image of God, but it is not quite God. The logos, according to origin, conferred invisibly a participation in himself upon all rational creatures. Now notice it's rational creatures, which would include creatures that are divine, as well as creatures that are, um, I shouldn't say divine, creatures that are spiritual and creatures that are eventually, and I'll get to this, material. They're all rational creatures. And so the logos conferred upon themselves, conferred upon them participation in himself, all rational creatures, meaning as mediator, the logos mediates the contemplation of God to all creation. However, since these rational creatures are finite and changeable and have the capacity of free choice, as you see in the text, they can and do fall away from God, All right? So if they cling to the logos, they remain or can remain spiritual, right? They're closer to the logos. As they fall away, this is from their choice, from the logos, they fall away from eternity, which is spiritual, into time, all right? From immaterial to material. And because God loves all his creation, God created a material ordered physical universe for those rational creatures who fell away from the spiritual to material. He situated them in the physical world as they began to re-educate themselves back to the knowledge of God in which alone their being is fulfilled. The logos must be mediated both to those who remained immaterial, but also to these fallen creatures in the physical world. And that is the point of the incarnation. Look further on 59 uh, in the next paragraph. It says, but that soul of which Jesus said, no man will take my soul from me, that soul from the beginning of his creation and after clung inseparably and persistently to him, to the wisdom and logos of God, the truth and the true light. It received as a whole, the whole of the logos. It entered itself into his light and his glory. Drop down to the next paragraph. Therefore, with the reality of this soul to mediate between God and flesh, for it was not possible for the divine nature to be mingled with body apart from a mediator. God, as we have said, was born a human. He had, as an intermediary, this substance for which assuming a body was not something that went against its nature. What Origen is saying is this. Jesus, okay, is the conjoining of one of those rational souls who did not move from the immaterial to the material, one of those rational souls that, that clung to the logos, so much so that it clung almost inseparably from the logos. Jesus is the conjoining of the logos and one of those immaterial souls. 
by the grace of God, Jesus was able to incarnate in the flesh, oops, sorry, in the flesh so that this conjoining of the logos and this soul which clung inseparably to the logos could be manifested and can be seen on earth. This is the Christology of origin. Right. Now to explain exactly what he means by this, he uses a analogy, a specific analogy. Um, he uses a philosophical illustration of the mixing or blending of two substances. Um, go to page 61. under section six, and we can see his illustration. For the sake of a fuller explanation of this matter, however, it does not seem out of place to employ an analogy. Even though in a matter so hard and difficult, it is not even within our power to find appropriate analogies, I mean, illustrations. Nevertheless, to speak apart from any consideration of this difficulty, iron is receptive to both cold and heat. Think then of a certain quantity of iron, which is kept always in a fire. It takes in fire by all its pores and passages. It is entirely made into fire. If the fire never for a moment leaves it and it is not removed from the fire, what happens? Can we possibly assert that this, which by its nature is plainly a quantity of iron, can at some point take on the quality of being cold when it, has, when it has been located in a fire and is burning away incessantly? On the contrary, we say that it is closer to the truth that just as we have frequently seen it happen in furnaces with our own eyes, this iron has been completely turned into fire on the ground that nothing is seen in it say fire. And what is moat that anyone who tried to touch or handle it will feel the effect, not of iron, but of fire. In this fashion, therefore, that soul, which like the iron in the fire, has been abidingly placed in the logos, in wisdom, in God, is God in all its acting, all its feeling, in all its understanding. What Origen is trying to say is this, as iron, if you take iron, which without being in the fire is cold, we can touch it, we can handle it. But if you put iron in a fire, all the qualities of fire, it's transferred by the fire to the iron. Even though the iron remains to be iron, all of its qualities are a fire. When you touch it, you burn yourself. It's hot, right? It gives off heat. He's saying the same thing happens with the soul, that immaterial soul, when it was conjoined with the logos, the divine logos, then that soul, even though it remained one of those immaterial souls, it took on the qualities of the logos, which means it took on the qualities of God because the logos is an imitation, a direct, perfect imitation of God. And that's the reason why Origen would say, Jesus could say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father also. This is the Christology of Origen. Now, there are many points of interest that we can expound on. But one matter stands out from the point of future developments, which we will be talking about in this course. As you should have seen from the diagram, by all means, go back um, and look at the diagram in the video if you need to. Origin shares Justin's sense of the need for mediation between God and the visible and spiritual creation. The divine does not mix too directly with the material world. It's the logos that mediates God 
to the soul. So the soul mediates God's son to the body. Jesus then, according to origin, is a human being, a soul, the immaterial soul, inhabited in the physical body, perfectly united with its divine intelligence, the logos. This is similar to Justin's logos theology in the sense that it supports the idea of a plurality or degree of divinity. The logos is not quite God the Father, right? There's a, there's a degree of divinity. In other words, when you're leading from Justin, martyr, to origin, and then for those after origin, remember, origin not being um, considered a heretic until well after the development of these questions regarding Christology, everyone believed and knew that the Logos was divine. No one argued that. What was what not clear, however, is exactly what divine meant. In other words, are we talking about degrees of divinity, right? As origin in a particular way that you could interpret, which origin obviously interpreted Justin Martyr, is there a degree to it? If so, then it will be consistent to say that the Logos is divine, but not quite God in the same sense, or is the same degree as God the Father. You see, this is where these type of questions, where we're talking about controversies and heresies, this is why I have a little bit of sympathy for the initial, what eventually would be called heretics. Because these individuals were not malicious enemies of the church. They were simply trying to make sense of what was considered at the time the teachings of the church fathers. The idea of the logos being similar to God, but not quite God on the surface, it seems to fit Justin Martyr and Origen. In fact, this understanding of Jesus led to what one of the largest controversies in the history of Christology, and that is called the Arian controversy. And the Arian controversy led to the first council of Nicaea, which is where we get the creed, Nicene Creed, which going forward will establish the foundational beliefs of the Christian tradition. These things will be the subject of our next lesson.